So, uh, I will make it a little shorter and talk some without my slides because I thought it would be longer. So, <clears throat> you know, if you do vitreoretinal surgery in general, but especially trauma, your greatest enemy is PVR. And the question is, how do you deal with PVR? Uh, there are many factors that we all know which will increase the risk of the patient uh, having PVR after either the event or your intervention. Some that you can deal with by reducing your surgical trauma, uh, and then there are others there is nothing that you can do about. One thing which is crucial is to do a complete vitrectomy, and that includes PVD. And usually it's an easy or fairly easy procedure. This short video shows one of my cases where PVD proved to be impossible. No matter what I did, uh, at this you know, short video shows uh, putting heavy liquid on the retina and instead of stabilizing the retina, as you can see, yeah, the, the, the vitreous actually cut into the bubble and it detached the retina under the heavy liquid uh, because it was so adherent. So it's not always possible. There are certain things you can do during surgery to reduce the risk. Cutting the operculum is one of the things that you have to do. Uh, as part of a complete vitreous removal. I always remove the vitreous behind the lens and this brief video just shows the technique how to do it if you want to preserve the lens. Uh, usually what I do is I put a little air bubble behind the lens. If there is no vitreous, the air bubble will escape towards the lens periphery. If uh, there is vitreous still there, then uh, the, the air bubble will get trapped. Another thing that is to me absolutely crucial is to look at the serial body in these eyes. Even in a phakic eye, you have to clean the ciliary processes from any tissue that you see there, whether it's vitreous, fibrine, whatever. Uh, you have to do indentation. It's depending on whether the eye is is phakic or, or uh, aphakic uh, or pseudophakic, that will determine whether you, you need somebody else to do the indentation for you or you do it yourself. But this is a crucial maneuver to reduce the risk of PVR and also to reduce the risk of tizis, uh, which is a very common complication in these uh, severely injured eyes. Again, uh, membranes, as we, as we all know, uh, taking the ILM in the, in the posterior pole uh, is very important. Uh, membranes in front of the retina, membranes under the retina. And the reason why I came up with this forceps is simply because many of the membranes that are subretinal have an orientation where the traditional forceps will not have enough traction. Uh, with this forceps, it doesn't matter. So if you deal with cases like this, I suggest to consider using it because you will not have an issue uh, about the quality of the tissue, orientation, texture, etc., you will be able to get all of them. Incarceration is a huge issue. This is something you can do to avoid trapping tissue, uh, which will lead to a retinal detachment later. Traditionally, when you close a wound, you make one pass with the needle. This is a great way to catch retina in the posterior sclera. So a very simple solution is to do a sequential suture introduction and this brief video will show you how to do that. You go in on one end, or one side of the wound, you come out and before you enter the other edge of the wound, uh, 
you are outside with your needle. So when you re-enter, you know that you are above the tissue and not uh, inside. And of course, as you go closer and closer to the posterior uh, sclera, you have to sup somewhere and not uh, catch tissue because you will do uh, more incarceration. So what you see here is the conjunctival is opened only anteriorly, the sclero is closed underneath that area. And further opening the conjunctiva does not come until the anterior aspect of the scleral wound is closed. So you can see that I'm going step by step more and more posteriorly in a two-step fashion Conjunctiva first, sclera second, conjunctiva again, sclera again. And when you get too posterior, you stop because if you go very posterior, you cannot avoid tissue incarceration. Uh, where that posterior point is, when you stop, it, there's no way to tell you in millimeters because it depends on the size of the orbit the size of the eyeball and many other factors. But if you have a little bit of experience, you know that this is not the way to, the, the point to stop. But to really deal with the tissue that is incarcerated is going internally and not externally. And so what I do is prophylactic chorioretinectomy. What does that mean? Simply, you use the highest uh, setting of your diathermy probe. I will skip this part and just show you the procedure. This is what you do. And what you see on this video is the bubbles that form. It's gas because you burn tissue, you evaporate tissue, and you surround the lesion and leave nothing but bare sclera behind. And this is the image that you will see postoperatively. There's white sclera, there is pigmentation around. Uh, let me skip these in the interest of time. And you have to remember once you incarcerate a tissue, even if you do not have true PVR, these are the folds that you will see. And these folds do not look like terrible, they are terrible. Uh, I know quite a few patients with this condition as a result of incarceration. And again, you can see this is where the original scar is, and they can reach very far in the retina. So some of these patients will actually cover the eye even though it has some vision because these full thickness retinal folds are extremely bothersome. Here is a case with a deep retinal impact caused by a foreign body which was treated the traditional way which is you take the foreign body and then you do laser. The problem is, again, that you have these folds and the patient's vision drops dramatically. So the option that you have is either accept it or do chorioretinectomy. And so what you do, and this is of course now not a prophylactic procedure, but you do essentially the same thing you burn the retina and the choroid. And this is a fairly old video. I would not do laser today because there is no traction left. There's no vitreous and doing the laser increases the scotoma. So I would leave this without any laser uh, today. So, <clears throat> come on. Here are some of the results. Uh, we have a lot of cases accumulated over the years. And so you see we have a lot of eyes with good follow-up. If you look at the literature uh, and, and look at what the expected rate of PVR would be, it's well over 60%. We had none, not a single eye with PVR coming from this site. We did have PVR cases but they were coming from uh, other areas inside the eye. Can we have the sound back again? Uh, so, it's a very easy procedure to do. All you have to do, again, you turn up 
your diathermy machine to 100%. And you go around, not inside, around the lesion, and that's it. I, I vacuum a little bit so the garbage disappears, uh, but there is nothing else to do. And, and this gives you a, a surgical option to deal with PVR coming from that location. This is not an ideal solution. It will not address PVR in general because, as I said, you still have some eyes that will develop PVR coming from other areas inside the eye. But the main thing is our traditional approach, which was take the foreign body, suture the wound, etc., and then laser. Uh, the retinal edge, unfortunately, does not work, so we have to change what we do. Okay, done. I have just a short technical question. Do you increase the pressure before you start diathermy to avoid bleeding or it just doesn't bleed? No, you don't need to do that because there are two differences from our traditional use of the diathermy probe. One is here, again, you have a full power. And unlike with, with the diathermy employed to stop bleeding where you just barely touch the tissue, here you keep your diathermy probe over the tissue a little longer. So I'm not saying I never had bleeding during this, uh, but it's an absolutely minimal bleeding and all you do in that case is to touch it again. So you don't, you don't control the bleeding by increasing the pressure as we you know, often try in, in other circumstances. Yeah, thank you very much. No more questions? May I ask something as well? I, actually, I have two quick questions. Um, the one is, if you have a scleral laceration with a retinal laceration, but no obvious incarceration of the retina in the site, do you still perform a chorioretinectomy in the area? The answer is yes. Because my, my general philosophy is that I'm not, uh, my aim is not to have a perfect anatomical condition at the end of the procedure. My goal is to have the same condition long term. And I don't like to leave things up to chance if there is a way to avoid that. So when I look at the eye, I look at the condition six months, six years down the road. And I know statistically that the chance of that condition going into PVR is very high. So I want to prevent that from happening. What the only disadvantage of this technique is that the discotoma that you have due to the original trauma is this big. When I do the chorioretinectomy, it will be somewhat larger. I think that's a, a very good deal uh, to do that and not accept what will come. You know, I, I did not play the video uh, because of, of the interest of time, but that was, would have been a typical case to show how it was perfectly done, everything with the laser and taking the foreign body, and etc. It was an excellent surgeon, but we are dealing with nature that wants to heal, and it heals by scar. So prevention is the key.